Hello, everyone. Welcome to Virtual VSC. Thank you for being here this evening. My name is Kristen Mills. I am your host for this evening. I guess you're here to listen to Julie. Um, I guess I'll read her bio and um, introduce her. And I'm really excited. There's Julie. <laughs> I'm really excited to hear um, Julie talk tonight. So let's get started with that. Julie Whites, am I pronouncing Whites correctly? I meant to ask you that earlier. Julie Whites is a queer Ashkenazi video and performance artist living on Tongva Gabrieleño land in Los Angeles, whose interdisciplinary practice also includes writing, teaching, and activism. Since 2010, her focus has been the production of experimental videos. These videos form the basis for broader immersive experiences, including live performances, narrative short films, and public art installations. Through a poetic reinterpretation of Yiddish folklore and Jewish mysticism, White's work uses humor and ritual to propose ethically grounded and intersectional reconsiderations of pressing contemporary issues. Mm. Ah. Whites has been featured in Art Form, Art in America, The Los Angeles Times, The New York Times, Bomb, LA Confidential, Photograph Magazine, Hyperallergic, on KCRW, and now on Virtual VSC. Her first solo museum exhibition opened at the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco, California this past June. Uh, Julie is a 2020 to 2021 cultural trailblazer of the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs and a Wallace Annenberg Helix Fellow at Yiddish Kept. You'll, you can correct me on that. She's received grants from the California Center for Cultural Innovation, the BAMP Center, Asylum Arts, and the Memorial Foundation for Jewish Culture. Julie currently teaches in Los Angeles and is a contributing writer to Contemporary Art Review Los Angeles. She also founded the Instagram account at Jews for Black Lives, which serves as an educational hub for the Jewish activist community in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Julie was also a resident at Vermont Studio Center in 2019. Yes, and that's where I met Julie. I thought maybe it was 18, but it was 2019. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, I've actually, this is the honest truth. I haven't stopped thinking about Julie since. And I was like, how do I get Julie here? Well, we're closed, so she's here virtually. At least that's a start. Uh, and without further ado, Julie, the floor is all yours. Wow. Thank you so much for that introduction, Kristen. And thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Um, it was actually 2020, January 2020. Oh. Whoa, no way. That's what's so weird. It was right before the pandemic. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I guess that it's, I'm sorry, because the pandemic just does this weird thing with time. And so totally, yeah. totally. It's hard okay. for me to remember because, yeah, it feels like ages ago. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here and to present you to y'all. Um, and as Kristen said, um, feel free to throw questions in the chat or unmute um, as I'm speaking. Since it's a small group, it could be more intimate as a conversation. So give me a moment to share my screen and get my slideshow started. Okay, so today I'm, I'm talking about one project, but this one project has many iterations and is very layered in content. So I, I always feel like there's all these parts to kind of explain and piece apart um, to give a fuller picture of what it is. So um, I have a performance art practice where I embody a golem. Here's a view of her in the forest. And she's very influenced by drag. Um, she's totally, I mean, inspired from Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah and Yiddish folklore. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment, but this is just to give you a sense, an overview. Um, and she doesn't speak. So that's another important component. I will, as I go along, I'll sort of piece apart, ask, there's a lot of symbology and kind of background information that I'll try and fill in about Golem mythology as we go. Um, but yes, please feel free to ask any questions if I skip over points. So first I like to start in just explaining what a Golem is. The word Golem literally means shapeless mass in Hebrew. Um, it occurs, the word Golem occurs once in the Torah when Adam is speaking to God and talking about uh, being made from dust out of nothing. 
so it's very much a creation myth. And in probably the 11th and 12th century in a Jewish mystical text, there was this proposition that you, as a mystic, there were a series of techniques that you could use to make a golem and you would take soil, mud, and shape a vessel of a figure and then direct them to seek justice. But actually I'm getting ahead of myself because in its original form, the golem was imagined more as a meditative technique, like an astral projection. Um, and if you're not familiar with Kabbalah, I mean, who really is? It's like impossible to get familiar with that text. The more I study it, the more, the less I know. Um, it's, it's a really enriching multifaceted text. But over the centuries, the golem story transitioned from this sort of meditative technique to uh, a Yiddish folktale. And it really came out of this need for a story of a protector. So the golem stories starting in about the 18th century become stories of the mystics creating a golem to go protect the Jews in Eastern Europe and Russia by, you know, to protect them from state-sponsored violence. And oftentimes the golem in popular culture today is oftentimes understood as a monster because implicit in the golem story is the idea that the golem exponentially grows and eventually can supersede their creator's authority. And there's many variations of golem stories. The most famous one is the golem of Prague. Um, I have not ever been to Prague, not yet at least, but my understanding is that golem souvenirs are all over the place. So golems reached popularity in um, a modern sense into a secular and non-Jewish world because of this silent film trilogy called Der Golem that was made by the German director, Paul Wagner. And you can see it was sort of a German expressionist film. And also obviously it was made by a non-Jew. So there's definitely some problematic aspects to the representation of the golem. But what's interesting is that in Jewish mythology, there is no picture of what the golem is. And it was really through a German representation of the golem that it, a popular image of the golem came about. And so here's an image from the golem appearing in a Simpsons episode. And you can see it's directly oh, from the last image we saw taken from Der Golem, the um, early silent film trilogy. Now, oh, I'm gonna jump ahead. I was interested in the golem mythology really since I first learned about it as a child. Um, but I started thinking about embo embodying a golem after the Unite the Right uh, white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017. At that point, I felt like as a white American Jew, I had to respond to what was happening and I wanted to root it in my own identity somehow. So embodying a golem seemed like the most obvious way. And I was clearly looking at a lot of silent film for reference. And um, I made these really ridiculous Instagram videos that I had no expectation of how it would grow. Um, I, I was doing a different kind of art project somewhat related, but definitely not Golem mythology, and they took off. So I'm gonna just show you an early clip. Um, The whole idea here was that I was going to attack the white supremacists by threatening them with drinking their blood because that, this is a, the blood libel is a um, historic anti-Semitic trope that um, Jews were accused of drinking the blood of um, Christian children. And <laughs> yeah, it was sort of ridiculous and playful, but what happened is people really responded. I made a number of these videos and I started getting invitations to develop the project as is resonant with the golem uh, metaphor. The golem kept growing and growing outside of my expectation of what I had planned for it. And so in a sense, I've, allowed, I've created an art project that um, is, is engineered and moves according to how other people respond to her and is somewhat out of my control to a certain extent. So the first invitation I got was to do this public art video installation um, 
in West Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard. And so I did uh, a two channel video on these billboards and um, they're basically like a golem coming to life. And at this point she was a real threatening character and sort of scary like the Instagram videos. Um, but given more time and opportunity, I started to, I don't know if refine is the right term, but maybe ex ex elevate the way that Golem um, represented herself. So the next film that I made was called The Great Dominatrix. Um, I should just say here, it's obvious that Golem came about at, during the rise of Trump's presidency. So she was completely a, a response to that from her origin. And The Great Dominatrix is based off of The, the Great Dictator, which is this 1940 film by Charlie Chaplin. First of all, I was very much inspired by silent film. I also was thinking of Charlie Chaplin as this clownish figure that I could imitate somehow. I actually have no performance training. Um, so I was really seeking out models for myself. And I also was looking more to film and mimes and clowns rather than performance art per se. Um, because I was interested in the, the, the theatrical aspect of this character. Um, and in the great dictator Chaplin's film, he plays two characters. One is a Jewish barber and the other is Hitler. Um, and there's this beautiful scene where he's performing as Hitler and he dances with the globe. And I thought, oh, this is perfect. My golem is gonna become a dominatrix and she's gonna try and dominate the globe. This also is ripping off the anti-Semitic trope that Jews control the world. Um, another thing I should just point out is you might've noticed the black wrapping um, that is somewhat of like a quote, a reference to like dominatrix, but it's also the religious um, leather called tefillin that, um, Jewish men traditionally wrap around themselves. She's also wearing a stremel, which is a hat that Orthodox Jewish men would wear. And she has payas, my curls are coming down. So I began to think about what are these signifiers of Jewish identity, at least to the outside world, um, knowing that there's also an inside language of um, Ashkenazi Jewish identity. And how can I play with it, play with gender, play with sexuality, um, and I'll show you a little trailer so you can get a sense of how this golem behaves. So at this point in the process, the golem is, um, you know, she's sassy, she's still a bit scary, she's disobedient. And I began to really rethink uh, what her character should be and what her function should be. And um, I was doing a lot of activist work in immigrant rights groups, um, specifically Never Again Action, which is a Jewish-led progressive organization um, that was work that works to abolish ICE and defend immigrants' rights, and um, I started to wonder what it would mean if I showed up as Golem to protest. And I spoke to fellow activists and organizations, and they thought that it would be a great idea. This idea of uh, political theater, a visual spectacle, being a way to bring a message across. So um, I began showing up as Golem in protests. And because she doesn't speak, I would often hand out like a printed sheet of paper explaining her context. And then of course I would carry these signs to make it very clear who she was and what, what she represented. So this is um, Golem at outside the ICE detention center in Adelanto in 2020. Um, and we were protesting the conditions for prisoners inside um, who you know were treated like prisoners, though they're just undocumented um, and what the conditions were regarding COVID safety. This is, um, these are images from the first protest that she attended and I just made this really obvious sign golem against ice. And we were um, sitting in at the, in the Amazon store um, in West Hollywood, in West Los Angeles, 
um, because uh, to protest their support for Palantir, which is a web um, company that was collecting information about um, undocumented immigrants. And, um, you know, it was my really my first venturing into the character in a public context. And she was so well received. People, first of all, people who knew what golems were really, were really excited. And then other people were just so curious and also very grateful. And, um, you know, I think that if you've ever been to, to protest, any kind of visual signs that really help the message stand out are important. Now, there's also, of course, this question that I had to begin to battle with is what does it mean to kind of dress up as the these, these stereotype of a Jew? Um, and because she doesn't speak, there, it, I had limited capacity to explain myself, although I always was around colleagues and fellow activists that, who could step in. And really, there never was a problem. It just is sort of a question after the fact that people have um, asked me about. Um, this was a really great protest we, so one, that we organized through Never Again Action. So first of all, one of our um, targets through our organization was to constantly protest outside of Geo Group, um, Geo Group's offices in LA. And basically they were housed in this office building that also housed like a university and other organizations. So our feeling was if we made a lot of noise on a consistent basis, eventually people, the landlord would be like, get this private prison group out of here. No one wants them. And actually like two years later, we succeeded and they left, they lost their lease. Um, but here we um, organized what's called a Purim Spiel, which is, um, a play that tells the story of Purim, which is a holiday that's, um, without getting into too much detail, basically celebrates uh, one character, Esther, protecting her Jewish community from um, unfair, unjust laws against them. So we sort of use that framework to talk about the unfair treatment of um, und undocumented folks. And it's a really celebratory holiday. So we also, um, people were banging pots and pans and we were dancing it. And it really it was, there was a level of absurdity um, to the act. Um, something else I was gonna say about this. Oh, is that the, what was cool for me in this process, first of all, was um, organizing a bunch of other Jewish um, performers, the, the woman in the gold, um, the black suit and the gold um, robe is a burlesque performer who <laughs> dresses up as a Yiddish kind of figure. Um, and so everyone had this, this history of being inspired by Yiddish theater. And, and that's a certain kind of performance history that I feel like my character comes out of where um, first historically there was the Purim spiel where Jews would perform the story of Purim. And then um, in Yiddish culture, there became plays of, about other stories that were non-religious. So it became more of a secular cultural performance. And eventually when American Jews um, immigrated to the United States, they got involved in vaudeville. And there was actually a, a term called Jew face where non-Jewish performers would perform as Jews, like stereotypes of Jews. And the Jewish actors came in and said, no, 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 we can perform much better. And um, from vaudeville kind of came the, the beginning of um, American, what, what's known as like popular Jewish American humor. Um, so that's sort of a really basic lineage. Here's um, a video that I made um, for this digital campaign that we put together. And this will just give you a sense of how her protests also exist online. Um, and I should note that in many of these videos, I'm using klezmer, which is like a traditional Yiddish um, music, musical form from Eastern Europe. So um, there, I'm skipping over a few other iterations of this project to really speak about the current um, iteration of my golem. And that's my golem as a wildland firefighter. Um, 
So let's kind of step in. I'm going to skip that image. How did my goal of become a wildland firefighter? Well, in 2019, I was invited by this really unique program um, in Sage Hen Creek Field Station in Tahoe National Forest, which is on Washoe land. Um, it's a st field station run by UC Berkeley, and they basically were creating advocacy programs um, to support prescribed burns. And I'll explain in a minute what that is if you're not clear about that story. Um, but I'll just say is that they understood, the program in, understood that artists and filmmakers could be public advocates and cultural translators of a situation around wildfire that's really kind of a mystery or unclear to the public. And I'll also explain why that is. So. They invited artists and filmmakers to get their basic wildland firefighter training, and I did it, and it was fantastic. Um, previous to that, I've been living in the Los Angeles area for nine, for eight, almost eight years, and um, you know, pr over the course of the years, each summer is the worst wildfire season, and and I had this kind of vague awareness of what wildfires were and how they were a threat. And um, once I started taking these wildland firefighting classes, like my understanding of the threat of wildfires and the way that we could better manage our forests in order to prevent these mega fires became really important and exciting. So I repositioned my whole goal and project around it. So I'm gonna just do a little education here about um, prescribed burns and what they mean. Um, first of all, uh, if you're not already aware of um, traditional ecological knowledge, the indigenous communities of the West uh, were always burning. Um, it's now known as cultural burning. It was a way to basically regenerate, to clear the basic um, ground of extra fuel, to regenerate um, and, and germinate new seed growth for the materials that they would use to make baskets and other um, plants. Um, and it was, uh, you know, against the romantic notion advocated by people like John Muir, it was not a, an untouched wilderness. And uh, unfortunately, the US Forest Service um, had created, and really the Spanish colonizers first, um, created a policy of fire suppression, which has caused all this fuel to build up in our forests and all of these, all the forests to grow in a very densely packed way. And so that's the reason we have these mega fires. I mean, one of them, we also have extreme climate conditions. Um, and I became interested in understanding how Golem could transition into a public advocate for uh, progressive wildfire management. Um, I want to also just point out here in some um, slideshows, I'm able to show this short video and we will provide a link to it um, in the chat later, but it is Ron Good, who is a tribal chairman from the North Folk Mono tribe, and he works with UC Davis students to learn about the impact of cultural burns. And it's a, a really um, great educational resource for understanding the relationship of burning for indigenous communities and also their effectiveness for managing forests. You know, one of the things that I really started to think about is how wildfires are for people living in, sit in large cities um, and people who aren't living on, on the West, they're like these visions of apocalypse. Um, and they only, we're only concerned about them when they start directly impacting us. And I, and I think that's, a, you know, obviously that's a really problematic way to view them. First of all, to view them as apocalyptic is completely hopeless. And I also think it's a sort of uh, like Christian hegemonic way of thinking about, um, you know, the end of the world. Um, and I think it creates this sort of dissonance or um, disassociation where, you know, you, you may see it from a distance or you may smell the smoke, but you're not directly impacted. Now, on the other hand, some people of course are directly impacted. Um, this is a scene from last year of burnt areas of the sequoias. And we know right now that wild land firefighters are trying to protect the sequoias. It's, it's really unbelievable that these trees that have survived fires for centuries because of the, the, the tree itself is fire resistant are now being burnt to char. 
And that, again, that is because we have these mega fires, catastrophic fires. Um, and I started to think about with all of the research that I was doing, what, what kind of perspective could I bring to the table regarding wildfires and progressive wildfire management and indigenous knowledge as uh, an American Jew, um, an Ashkenazi Jew. And Ashkenazi just means that my family heritage is from Eastern Europe and Russia. Um, so I re-enacted my wildfire training at Sage Hen. And here um, Golem is posing um, near a pile of wood that's been collected to burn. So it, they're pieces of dead wood or low hanging branches and all of this lumber gets collected in piles. And now this is a specific technique that Sage Hen has developed and is advocating and there's other methods of prescribed burn. Um, but I'm gonna show you the grounds of what that looks like um, at Sage Hen. So each of these circles of ash were once those piles of lumber. And this is um, a clip from a film that I made called My Golem is a Wildland Firefighter that's currently on view at the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco. And um, it gives you a sense of why clearing out the forests and burning the extra fuel is important. So the fires end up like the, all the small trees, these densely packed forests cause the, this like bigger impact in terms of the size of the fire. And it's a hard notion, one, for us to think about fire being good and um, using prescribed burns as a preventative measure. And also of um, accepting the idea that we have to cut down trees in order to save the forest. Um, the other thing that I started to think about is how Golem could be like a, what, what you might call a sacred clown um, to talk about these difficult matters. Because even though I'm sort of being a little bit um, instructional right now or educational about the, the way wildfires work, just for context, um, I don't see myself as a wildfire educator in any way. I think that Golem serves more as this cultural and spiritual ambassador to kind of speak to the absurdity of the situation, bring levity and humor, and also a sense of spirituality. And I'll explain more how that evolves in the project. But here you'll see like in this film, Golem's reenacting the wildfire, wildland firefighting techniques that I learned, but she's like ridiculous at it. Like she would never use a garden hose and she gets herself all tied up in the garden hose. So it's more to think about um, when you watch the video, I hope that people sort of get a sense of actually what while a lot of people have this false vision of wildland firefighters just using hoses and, and you know, watering out the fires and that's not it at all. Usually the first thing that they often do is build a fire line, which is like a dugout perimeter of dirt and clearing to keep the fire from going past that line. So really Golem does a lot of digging, et cetera. Um, she also spends a lot of time <laughs> hugging and uh, really getting connected to the trees. And that's something that has been important for me in this project is that um, Golem as this nonverbal character very much senses the world around her. And as a kind of humanoid, she's not quite human. She has a relationship to the more than human world that humans have forgotten about, that um, we are disconnected from. Um, this image, it, I started to also think about how Golem could, in, in a very ironic, you know, I would say humble way, how Golem could be a replacement for Smokey the Bear in terms of iconography. And um, Smokey, Smokey was actually as cute as he is, he was actually um, like a propaganda campaign to support fire suppression. So even though in some ways he taught, you know, little kids the process of how to put out a campfire correctly, he also um, propagated this idea that all fire is bad, um, which is entirely untrue. Um, and it was a, really a propaganda campaign designed by Mad Men, you know, Ad Men um, in New York and um, used by the US Forest Service um, to promote 
fire suppression, which again was this uh, coincided with the oppression of indigenous cultural fire, because what this has meant is that for year, for decades, um, indigenous communities were not able to practice cultural fire. And in fact, in moments were um, put in jail or fined heavily. Um, now that has been changing, thankfully, that cultural fire um, and wildland firefighting is being integrated more into an awareness around progressive wildfire policy. So I'm gonna end talking about this last film that I made called Prayer for Burnt Forests. Um, and this is really where the idea of Golem as a spiritual figure comes about. So um, I'll speak a little bit about my own personal experience with fire. Last year, um, I was living in the, near the mountains outside of the city and the, and the Bobcat fire broke out in um, like 20 miles Northeast of me. And I woke up one morning unable to breathe. My asthma was triggered because the air quality was so poor. And I was living in a house without AC and it was an old house without proper insulation. Um, and so it's the middle of a pandemic. And, and by the way, this is a minor story in all the many stories that I know of friends who live in fire prone areas and have had to be evacuated, even have had um, their home destroyed or their family's homes destroyed. Um, in my case, I was sort of in this weird position of there's nowhere to go because you can't be in you know, a coffee shop or you can, you can hardly even go to other people's houses in the middle of a pandemic. And um, I had to scramble to figure out um, how to get out of town and find a safe place to be for a week. Um, and that experience really shook me up. Um, and, and then even recently this summer, I was um, on a backpacking trip, had to hike out a day early because of fire. Um, I'm a big hiker. Anytime I go through the forest, there's um, big sections of forests um, in California that are burnt. And then I was teaching in a program in Tahoe recently and uh, the Keldor fire broke out and it was like the worst AQI ever. And, you know, we couldn't breathe or ash, ash in our eyes. Tahoe's supposed to be this beautiful place. I was there for 10 days. Um, only one and a half days out of that, those 10 days was it clear. So you couldn't even be outside. So this is just like the new reality for, for us in the West. And how do you deal with it? Um, you know, a lot of people go to the gloom and doom and I really look towards my own spiritual belief practice traditions to find hope. And in Judaism, fire is a symbol of hope. And um, it's also a source of life. Um, the, the, it's also a source of creativity symbolically in Kabbalistic texts. And I started to kind of um, cultivate that in my mind. And then what happened is, I'm gonna skip images for a sec. I co-wrote a prayer. Um, and this I wrote during the fires that I was impacted by with, uh, and I wrote this with uh, my rabbi friend. And um, if, you, if you read along with the prayer, um, and I'll also provide a link where you can download it. Um, it's basically a way of um, atoning and reorienting towards repair. So, and connecting with the elements, the natural elements and acknowledging that there is a creator beyond what we know that, um, and that we have to live in reciprocity and um, really ask forgiveness. And then it's, it's also um, bookended by the story that's referencing um, is Honey the Circle Maker, which is a story from the Talmud, which is basically this sage who drew a circle in the sand and stayed in that circle um, until, he, until it rained. Um, and it was like during a period of drought. Um, and so he really had this like commitment to uh, human culpability and respond to natural, or in this case, at this point, unnatural disaster. Um, so sort of going back, this is one of the final scenes in Prayer for Burnt Forests. Um, it's a 14 minute film and I'll, sh I'll definitely show us a little clip. Um, the other thing about this film is we shot it in Angeles National Forest near where the fire had broken out in 2020. And um, it, it was a, a really strange landscape to be filming in, um, very intense. 
Um, and also there was an element of, of magic there. And you can see in its final scene that there's this new growth, all these green sprouts growing up along with the burnt trees. And, you know, in that sense, fire, obviously the destructive catastrophic fires are ca exactly that catastrophic. Um, but the more that we can reorient our thinking around fire as um, not only a force of destruction, but a force of good and fire is something we can integrate into our forest management. Um, the more the, the public is able to accept that, I think um, the more we'll be able to work preventatively against these mega fires. Um, so this prayer um, has been translated into four languages so far. And um, the museum where I'm currently showing recently printed these prayer cards that actually I have them over there, but I'm not gonna grab them right now. And they're small and they're actually cards that you would um, bring with you on hikes or really whenever you feel like you need to ground yourself in some sort of prayer. And by prayer, in this case, I also mean poetry, um, some sort of statement. Obviously I'm, I'm writing from a, a Jewish perspective, but I also see this as having an um, open enough language that it could be adapted in terms of the, the context and meaning. So I'm beginning to really integrate this um, prayer, not just as a film and art project, but as a ritual. And I am working on a ritual performance. I've also um, been sending out the prayer to lots of different Jewish organizations and congregations. And this year, especially around the holiday of Yom Kippur, which is a which is a holiday of atonement. Um, many groups of people have integrated the prayer into their ceremony. And that's a, that's a really um, touching thing for me. So I'll just show you um, this one clip. Um, the film is 14 minutes long and a lot happens over the course of the film, but essentially Golem, um, it's a movement-based um, performance of the prayer. Um, and, um, and this is the short sequence where sh she's doing maybe the most sort of yoga dance inspired movement. The rest of her movements in the landscape are a little bit more like physical theater or clownish. Um, and I'll also say that I worked with a series of musicians and a Hebrew vocalist um, to write the score. <laughs> עולם של ראייה שנוכחות לא נקראה בפי כל אמהותינו שהלכו לפנינו ברובי צורות, ברובי שמות קוראים עליכם על אחי וראשי התאמה, מים, רוח, so the last thing I just want to um, share with you is uh, work that I'm doing with this really amazing organization called the Forestry and Fire Recruitment Program. Um, so they are a program that helps formerly incarcerated firefighters transition into firefighting jobs um, post um, prison. And um, it's becoming more well known, but almost 40% of Cal California wildfires, wildland firefighters are incarcerated and they're treated like indentured servants. Um, um, they're only paid like $2 a day for like some, it's, it's such, such hard work. And additionally that um, it was only in this past year that Gavin Newsom, um, this is his little photo app from fire, season last year, he signed this bill that um, previous to this bill, it was very, very difficult, almost impossible to transition into a firefighting job post-prison, which is seems totally ridiculous and unjust that the state would train you and then you wouldn't be able to get a job in the field that you were trained. Um, so this program, FFRP, helps uh, these uh, men and women transition and they heard about my project and they invited me to teach yoga and mindfulness classes. So you can hardly see me, but I'm kind of in the corner. Um, and um, this has been fascinating and I really just got, a, got started doing this. But for me, it's like, uh, 
there, first of all, there's the trauma experience of being incarcerated, and then there's the trauma of wildland firefighting. So if I can be of service in helping support the mental and physical health of wildland firefighters, it's just, I'm so grateful for that kind of opportunity. Um, also thinking about my ethical responsibility in making work about this, that I somehow have to also have outreach and impact um, beyond the art community. So that is, it and I'm happy to um, answer any questions or have a conversation with y'all. That was amazing. I'm going to start with that. Thank you. Uh, if anyone has questions, <laughs> if anyone has questions, uh, like Julie just said, feel free to just do it or put them in the chat and I'm gonna pull up some links that Julie sent to me. I'm gonna throw them in the chat so you can follow up with some of the things that she mentioned in her talk. Mm. Yeah, so you can actually um, view the both of my videos um, that are online through the CJM. Um, and let's see, your crew in taking the photos and videos, how that evolved through the process. Yes, thank you, Catherine, for your question. Let's see, I think if I understand your question, it's just like, what is the process of working? Oh, thank you, Alex, I just see your, um, <laughs> okay, what, what is the process? And Leah, thank you too for that kind note. Um, your crew and taking the photos and videos and how that evolved through the top. Come online, oh, yeah. I don't have Please. my video on, but I, I just wanted to ask, um, were you taking these photos um, by yourself or did you have crew and same question with respect to uh, your videos and did you start off in one fashion and shift over time? Thank you so much for taking my question. Yeah, of course. Yes, um, I always, um, because I always understood her to be this performative character, I always made sure that I, I would have a photographer um, with me and usually they would just be my friend, um, especially at the protests. Um, and then like uh, weirdly somehow with the great dominatrix and the early Instagram videos, I filmed them completely by myself. And that was a really laborious process, but I think it was so early on that I was just willing to do it to try and figure it out. So I would literally, um, you know, be behind the camera setting everything up in the lights and then be in costume and be in white face and, um, and then do some movements and then review it and then see how I needed to fill in. So it was like a very lengthy process. But once I began to feel clearer about the vision and then also get more opportunities. So this latest film, Prayer for Burnt Forest was, a commission and so I was able to bring an actual crew on um, and they're always still friends and collaborators but they're paid and um, they also are real like troopers and adaptive because we go into these landscapes that are difficult so they have to be sort of up for that um, yeah and now moving forward I'm at a point where um, I'm, I'm being much more um, careful and mindful about how I create these, the video and documentation of the work, because um, I think in the beginning, it was like, I was so curious and just willing to take these risks. Um, and now I, I think I just have more reverence for like the process. And so I, I'm, I slow down and when I'm developing something, I'm, I'm developing it, it and waiting for the opportunity to actually be able to make it because it, it is costly to bring in a lot of collaborators. Thank you so much. That's really interesting. And I appreciate understanding, you know, that initial part where you're developing a project to want to have some privacy with it and just freedom to explore. Um, thank you so much. And I really love your work and the way you explained everything today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I have a, a few questions maybe, but I'm gonna make a comment first. I love when you said that you have no performance training. 
Um, I'm a big believer in not having training in something, but knowing that that's still the medium you need to use. Um, and so you will maybe um, enter it in a more raw and honest way. Uh, maybe not so formulaic possibly. Um, so I just wanted to know other than um, say mimes or clowns or Charlie Chaplin, um, someone who comes to mind is Jacques Tati. Um, like who, what other performers have you looked at? Uh, and yeah, and, or who are you currently looking at? Yeah, that's, I guess my question. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, I should say, um, I, early on, I was really channeling like my family, my grandparents and stuff through the character. So I was looking at a lot of like Yiddish film and thinking about um, like stereotypical Jewish mannerisms. And, um, and, and I really am just beginning to speak about this aspect of the process kind of more in a spiritual context, less of an art context. But for me, becoming the golem is a spiritual experience. <sighs> And, and it is leading me more towards is like uh, oh, that somebody's, might... somebody's not me. Uh, yeah it's it's leading me more and more towards spiritual practice so mm -hmm. so this idea that early on I was channeling my grandparents and um, felt like really the the zeitgeist of the the performative aspect of the character I also should just say that my family is very they're there's a history of performance in my family. Um, for those of you who are of a certain generation, you might recognize this reference. So my great, great aunt was Clara Peller, who is the woman who said, where's the beef in the Wendy's commercial? No way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my family, like my family for sure, like we've grown up, we, we um, have a huge cousins club and we do these talent shows and performances for each other. And, Again, I think that comes out of Yiddish theater. So culturally that felt really re resonant. But now I'm actually taking, I take classes at the clown school, which um, isn't traditional clowning. It, it's more, um, uh, it, it goes deep into history of clowning. And like right now, could, could, that, um, could that be muted? Sure, it looks like everyone is muted. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Um, uh, thinking a lot about mask work um, and what it means to wear a mask and embodying um, a character through the mask. And um, yeah, I, I still think definitely Chaplin, I, I often go back to and really like a certain kind of slapstick and physical theater. Um, but one of the things that I find more and more is as I connect deeper to the Kabbalistic aspects of the Golem mythology, I'm able to ground myself in that sensation of what it means to become a Golem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Hi, so hi Daniel. this is Daniel. <laughs> hi. <laughs> so happy to hi. have you here. I'm happy to be here. Um, I had this question at the beginning of uh, when Kristen was asking, but I, um, I remember when you were a resident, you talking about um, the transition that the golem was going from being this dominatrix feminine character into this firefighter. Um, but I was wondering about your experience of performing that and what it's like to change um, I don't know because you're you're kind of acting as the director and as this character and the character has this knowledge base of the past and how that transitions through as she evolves. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the ways that transition happens is through the costume changes. So mm -hmm. I work with a, a fellow artist collaborator who also does costume and fashion and um, as we design and develop the concepts of the costume, I think it helps facilitate the develop the redevelopment of the character. So, like with the um, so yeah, the dominatrix was so explicitly sexual um, that like just every time I'm trying on and trying to kind of like get into the costume, 
it just explicitly brings out that aspect of the character where it's like once I put the wildland firefighting outfit on like she's sort of a drudge like you know there's this sort of gender neutrality that happens um and then the like the spiritual aspect easily came in through the we made a what's called the talit katan which is the the, the robe that golem's wearing and um at that point, there was so much attention given to like the traditional ways that's made and the seat seat, which are the ropes, the fringes at the bottom of the dress that um, I made that uh, there's like this time method that adds up to um, 613. It's a num numerological system and 613 are the number of meets vote or what's known as, you know, translated poorly as good deeds that you're supposed to do to be a good person. And so like that making process, which is also like the most material aspect of the project really helps that transition. Um, and I think like the other question around like being the director and the performer has been a bit complicated and I've tried to work with co-directors and um, I think it's, it's a challenging process because I have a vision for what I want, but also when I'm completely in character, I, I have a trouble, um, I, I can't sort of embody both um, consciousnesses at the same time. So I'm still sort of working out what that means. Um, and sometimes in future projects, I imagine actually casting someone else to be the golem and a new golem would maybe be a different version and not the golem, my golem. Um, I see Don. Hi, Don. Thanks for being here. Don has this question. Um, yeah, there are projects. There are more projects in the works. Um, I'm just going to read it out loud just so, because some people maybe mm -hmm. aren't looking at the chat. Um, it says, are there projects in the works for your golem? Yeah, there's there's a few projects. I'll try to be brief. The, well, first is um, d creating Prayer for Burnt Forest is a ritual performance. Um, and uh, I, I'm working on a performance that I, I hope will take place soon that will be... Um, really right outside my door um, this summer uh, in Debs Park, which is a park in um, East Los Angeles, there was a brush fire and seven acres were burnt. And so I wanna bring a group of people out there and do some ritual around the recitation of the prayer um, and also working with indigenous artists and activists to make a guided tour of mm -hmm. like audio tour of, of a hike that we would take around the burnt area of the forest. And I'm really interested in like how this prayer becomes more activated as a ritual. Um, some other projects I'll say, I have this, this is an extension of um, how Golem becomes something else, but basically in the description that I just gave of the costume, the seat seat, um, after I made that, I started thinking about actually wanting a seat seat for myself, um, like a ritual garment. And traditionally these are, um, uh, ritual clothes that are worn almost as an undergarment and traditionally only worn um, by cis men. Um, but there is a movement in progressive Jewish and queer community communities where queer women, trans and non-binary folks are wearing these, um, but there aren't really great designs for made for different body types. Um, and so my fellow collaborator and I, Jill Spector, are developing what we're calling the Seat Seat Project. And we're creating a line of Seat Seat for queer Jews. Um, and we're getting really great feedback around that right now. We're doing a lot of research. And then I'm working on a theatrical project of the Golem called My Golem's Golem. And um, it's going to be really weird <laughs> and psychedelic. Um, I, I, I don't know that I've, I can talk about it yet, but basically I'll say that the, the more psychedelic aspects of the project having to do with Kabbalah are gonna be kind of the, the theme um, and this idea of ancestral trauma and how uh, if the golem makes her own golem, what kind of horrors or um, elements of joy or just unexpected things she has to confront. So it's maybe a more, um, a golem of the golem's mind. Thank you for that, Julie. 
Um, yeah. Can I follow up with one other quick question? I don't know if you're trying to get out right at five. Um, I'm just curious how the indigenous community has reacted to the golem. And that's my only question. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I can only speak to like my friends and colleagues who are indigenous. I can't really speak, you know, speak to like a whole community. Um, but um, I'm, I'm working now with an, uh, a Tongva elder and um, for her in the conversations that we've had, it really resonates. Um, even the concept of sacred clown, it shows up in lots of different indigenous um, traditions like the Lakota have the Hikoya, um, where basically it's like a character who does things backwards um, or out of the uh, or the ordinary absurdist kind of behavior to bring attention to problems in the community. Um, so I think, and I think there's also, I'm working with um, a group of activists, um, Jewish and indigenous kind of coalition building. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, thinking about Judaism in relation to ecology is that the Torah is entirely, it's, it's very much, Judaism itself is very much an agricultural religion and it grew, a lot of the ideas grew out of um, the relationship to the land. Um, so in a lot of the activist work I'm doing that's also inspiring the Golem Project is around um, ecological justice from a Jewish lens. And of course, there's an intersectionality with um, like indigenous wisdom around the land. Um, yeah, and, and reparation. So I'll just say, um, without going too deep into it, but um, if, if you're not aware of it, this, this year on the Hebrew calendar is called the Shemitah year, which is like, if you know the term sabbatical, um, it's basically every seven years, according to the lunar calendar, which is the Hebrew calendar, um, you're supposed to give the land rest and not reap harvest from the land. And you're also supposed to forgive all debts. So it's basically like a resetting of society to be more just and ecologically aware. And um, I'm working with um, other Jewish activists to frame Shemitah around black and indigenous reparations. Um, so that's just like really fulfilling work. Yeah. And, I, and I'm sure it will interweave into the Golems project somehow too. Can you type how to spell that into the chat? Yeah, Shmita. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. Shmita, and um, I will be giving a talk about Shmita um, through Coaxial, um, which is an organization in LA um, on October 5th. So if you, I'm gonna do a weird plug, but if you follow me on Instagram, I'll post about it and you can link to that. And I'm really excited about that. I'm gonna be doing it with two other Jewish activists who are doing super cool projects to support um, reparations. Yeah, thank you all. <laughs> Someone said, yeah. I always thought the golem was made out of mud or clay. Yeah, well, I put uh, some, porcelain clay on my face. That's about as clay as I get. <laughs> Thank you all. That was so great. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, yeah, I've got a lot to think about now. <laughs> awesome. And feel free to reach out through my website or on Instagram. I'd love to be in touch with anyone who's interested. Yay. Yeah. I'll email you tomorrow, Julie. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Take care, everyone.